prepared for service, led by the gospel, called by God into ministry, they will be sent in every direction to congregations of every size and shape, from rural America to bustling city centers and to the four corners of the world. The wait is almost over. Call Day 2022. Join us live at csl.edu slash call day. Tuesday, April 26th. Assignment of vicarages and internships, 3 p.m. Central Time. Assignment of calls, 7 p.m. Central Time. Be a part of the excitement of Call Day. Be among the first to learn where our future pastors and deaconesses are going. Share the celebration. Local and nationwide friends of Concordia Seminary. Support the SEM on Give STL Day, May 5th, 2022. Organized by the St. Louis Community Foundation, this annual online one day giving event supports local St. Louis nonprofits. This year, Concordia Seminary is one of more than 200 participating local nonprofits. You can help carry out the seminary's vital mission on this special day of giving. Because of your generosity, our graduates go out from St. Louis to the four corners of the world to shine the light of the gospel. Thanks to a generous donor, donations up to the first $12,000 given will be matched dollar for dollar. Early giving begins April 5th at givestlday.org slash concordiasm. Give now at csl.edu slash give or learn more at csl.edu slash support.
Concordia Seminary is an institution that serves Jesus Christ and seeks to root students in the testimony of his saving work so that they can bring his comfort and his hope into the lives of the sinners whom he has redeemed. All of our faculty members are highly qualified. That means usually an earned doctorate. It means extensive education. It means parish experience, which we take very seriously here for faculty members. Concordia Seminary knows that the gospel message does not change, but the world and the culture around them does. So they work hard to help us find effective ways to bring the gospel to those people in our communities. Concordia Seminary has existed for 182 years, and throughout that time, it has had a consistent mission to retain the clear confession of the gospel rediscovered by Martin Luther and the reformers in the 16th century, and to bring that good news, that unchanging good news of salvation into the lives of people today. Well, the reach of Concordia Seminary and its students goes around the world. Concordia Seminary has two residential ministerial formation programs, the Master of Divinity program for men and the Deaconess program for women who desire to offer themselves for service within Christ Church. The classes have been awesome here in the MDiv program. I really enjoy learning. I enjoy the academic side of studying and of theology. The classes go really in depth. Every single class I go to, I come away with insights that I never would have thought about. Concordia Seminary is a place where I'll get shaped to be a minister of God's word. And as a minister of God's word, I get to deliver hope. And to deliver hope to people is, is such a great privilege. And I'm so excited to do it and to be shaped here by the tremendous people at Concordia Seminary uh, will make me more effective than I, than I ever could have dreamed. EIIT is an acronym for Ethnic Immigrant Institute of Theology. And this is a special program that our seminary offers to engage immigrants and those who are serving immigrants here in America. We have a Center for Hispanic Studies program. This allows us to teach both U.S. Hispanic Latinos who are first-generation immigrants and also to offer courses to students in Latin America. I have had the pleasure of interacting with a number of international students here at the seminary, and I am always greatly enriched by the wisdom, the insights, the perspectives that they bring. Students from other countries come to Concordia Seminary because of the excellence of our education programs and because of the training that we offer them. Concordia Seminary is important to the larger church um, because there's a lot of competing beliefs and value systems that are out there now. And Concordia provides the training and the teaching that is consistent with the biblical teachings and theology of Christianity. They know that coming here to Concordia Seminary, they don't have to ever question or doubt the theological integrity of what is being taught. I really think the benefit of having a seminary in the city like St. Louis is that there's a lot of experiences of a lot of diverse uh, neighborhoods and communities and ministries. And so the students get to experience firsthand a, a great variety. Concordia Seminary trains pastors and teachers and deaconesses, but it also serves the church at large. The seminary is the seminary of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and it helps our lay people understand more about God and His Word. We need students here so that we can carry out our mission. <laughs> we need students so that we can carry out the Lord's mission, that we can carry out the Great Commission. For leaders and servants of the Word to go forth, they need to be trained and formed. For anyone interested in theology who isn't near St. Louis, we offer a lot of resources on our Concordia Theology website. This is the place to go if you're interested in specific theological topics or if you just want to see what our faculty is working on lately. Concordia Seminary is a great servant to the church in preparing pastors who will connect with each succeeding generation, but who will also establish a faith in the church by pointing the church consistently to Jesus Christ. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. We depend on the church to send students here to the seminary. Thank you for your prayers and your support.
prepared for service, led by the gospel, called by God into ministry, they will be sent in every direction to congregations of every size and shape, from rural America to bustling city centers and to the four corners of the world. The wait is almost over. Call Day 2022. Join us live at csl.edu slash call day. Tuesday, April 26th. Assignment of vicarages and internships, 3 p.m. Central Time. Assignment of calls, 7 p.m. Central Time. Be a part of the excitement of Call Day. Be among the first to learn where our future pastors and deaconesses are going. Share the celebration.
O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory. with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through Please be seated. A reading from Acts, the fifth chapter. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. 
And when they had heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them. Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. O Lord, have mercy upon us.
A reading from John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. O Lord, have mercy on us. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.
Christ is risen. He is risen Alleluia. Amen. President Egger, seminary faculty, President Harrison, Chairman Meyer, colleagues on the council, family, friends, members of calling congregations, and you, candidates for the pastoral and diaconal ministry. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We focus our attention on the reading from John chapter 20. You can tell a lot about a person's hands. Are they rough or smooth? Maybe you can tell what they do for a living. Maybe you can tell what they do for fun. When the person holds something, do they hold it carefully or do they grip it tightly? Pastors see hands all the time, and it's not just on the way out of church, you know, the good sermon pastor and the quick handshake or the high five from the little one. Pastors regularly have the preschool children show them their pains and ouches on their hands. But pastors also regularly hold the hands of those in the hospital as they pray. Pastors will see nervous grooms try to put the ring on the finger, <laughs> but their hand is shaking so much. And in a few minutes, it will be seeing nervous candidates receiving the call documents, but their hands shaking a bit as well. Pastors observe those who cradle well-worn Bibles. They notice the tremors of those played with Parkinson's as they open their hand to receive Christ's body. You can learn a lot about a person by noticing their hands. Before Jesus appears to the ten behind the locked doors, Thomas had already seen Jesus' hands at work so many times. He saw him as he bent down and as he spit into the dirt and, and made the little piles of mud and place them over the blind man's eyes before giving him sight. He saw him put his fingers into the deaf man's ears, spit and touch his tongue. He saw him as he laid his hands on the little children and blessed them. He was there when he, when he touched the leper and healed him. He saw him reach out to Peter and take his hand as he began to sink into the sea. He witnessed him break the loaves and give them to the disciples to feed the crowd along with the fish. He watched him get up from the table and wash their feet. He even saw Jesus reach out and touch the beer, the makeshift casket, and raise the widow at Nain's son. He was, he knew, saw Jesus as he reached out and took Jairus' daughter by the hand, brought her back to life. Thomas had seen Jesus' hands perform acts of mercy, miraculous deeds, even showing power over death itself. But before he's going to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, he wants to see his hands for himself. Thomas is not the first nor the last person who wants to be shown proof. Many have heard the word of truth and yet wanted evidence, something that they could see, something that they could touch. 
Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. But the goal is always that they believe. In 1899, Missouri Congressman Willard Duncan Vandiver was speaking at a naval banquet, and he said to the crowd assembled that night, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats. And frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You have to show me. And it stuck. The show me state Missouri became. Jesus shows Missouri's favorite son, Thomas, his hands. <laughs> if the light's not too bright, if you look at the stained glass window, we see such hands. The nail marks there. These are the same hands that Thomas had seen touching and blessing the crowds of people and healing those who were sick and diseased. These were the same hands that had given to Thomas his very own body and blood under, with the bread and cup. These are the same hands that had borne his own cross on the path to Calvary. Jesus shows to Thomas his all too familiar hands bearing the marks of the nails, the ultimate demonstration of God's love for humanity and even God's love for him. Thomas saw Jesus, he saw his hands. When I preach now, it is usually at a different place each time. Pulpits are different. They're all a little bit different. But there are several pulpits across Missouri that inside of the pulpit, it has a little plaque. And it quotes from John chapter 12. Sir, we would see Jesus. I don't think that sentiment is confined to the show me state either. Tonight and tomorrow as well, people from Missouri and Michigan, people from Oregon to Ohio are watching these services and they are praying. Now, in a few moments, they will be wanting to catch a glimpse of you. They will want to see you but more than seeing you, they wish to see Jesus. They are like the Greeks who came to Philip at the feast. And that is what they have done in sending their paperwork in and signing the documents and jumping through all of the necessary steps, not hoops, but steps. <laughs> they have prayed that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest, that God would send them those who would show them Jesus. That's what they have prayed for from a pastor, one who will show them Jesus, who will preach Jesus, who will give them Jesus. As children are baptized, as absolution is pronounced, as Christ's body and blood are distributed, as the word is proclaimed, Christ is revealed, God shows his beloved son, Jesus. For ultimately, it is Christ who is present for his people in the means of grace. The same hands that showed the disciples the Father are revealed today as the word is preached, as the sacraments are administered, God's people see Jesus. That's what tonight is all about. 
Congregations all over our country have been praying for a pastor. Tonight's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about even us. It's about Jesus for his people. Everything John wrote, he made quite clear, was for the purpose of showing Jesus to the world so that they might believe in him and that by believing they might have life in his name. That's why we have a seminary. That's why we have a synod. That's why we have congregations so that people would see Jesus and that they would believe in him and have life in his name. That's why pastors are being sent from New York to Nebraska and all points in between so that they might believe that Jesus' hands were pierced for them. That he shed his blood on the cross for them. That in him all of their sins are forgiven. And that in him, the one who died and rose again, in him they might have everlasting life in his name. But for you candidates candidates, diaconal candidates. Those hands weren't just pierced for members of congregations out there. They were pierced for you also. The same hands that washed Thomas's feet have washed away your sins. Those hands that Jesus shows to Thomas were pierced for you also. For all of your failings, past, present, and let me break it to you, there's going to be a lot in the future. Christ died and rose again for them all, that you would know your sins are forgiven. Each time I meet with a congregation that's preparing to call a pastor and we begin to talk about calling a pastor from the seminary, here's what I say. Here's the positive thing about calling a pastor from the seminary. They are usually, usually young. Not always. They're usually young. And they come in with a lot of excitement. They come in with a lot of energy. And they come in willing to try things, even willing to fail and make mistakes along the way. And then I say, here's the challenging part of calling a graduate from the seminary. They're usually young. <laughs> they come in with a lot of energy. <laughs> They're willing to try things, even willing to fail, and they make mistakes too. Dear friends, when you go from this place, know that those hands were pierced for you and have covered over all of your sins. That's the great comfort that you carry with you from this place. None of us knows what lies ahead in future. In 2019, when the call services were held, we didn't think it would take three years for the building to be full again. None of us knows when congregations might become embroiled in conflict or when communities might be struck by disaster. None of us knows when we might face afflictions or have to bear the cross. But for all of those times, we would see Jesus and his pierced hands for us. To those who doubted God in the 8th century, who worried that Yahweh had forsaken and forgotten them, he responds through Isaiah the prophet, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. 
Those nail-marked hands of the suffering servant are engraved with your name also. And as you are sent out, you pastors, as under-shepherds of the Good Shepherd, you're also given the promise that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's God's promise for every pastor elect, for every deaconess elect, for every baptized child of God. No one can snatch you out of Jesus' hands. So, dear friends, may you see Jesus. May you see the wounds of his hands that he endured for you, for all of your sins. May you be assured that your name is engraved on his hands, that no one can snatch you out of those precious hands. And finally, may your ministry always be focused on showing Jesus to others that they might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, they may have life in his name. Amen.
in Christ's name, we welcome you who are present here in this chapel, as well as those who are watching and participating in this service via live stream over the internet. This evening is a joyous occasion for all of us. Tonight, the Concordia Seminary community joins our candidates, their spouses and children, families and friends, supporting and calling congregations, and praising God and celebrating his gifts of workers for his church. Candidates, I'm going to ask you at this time to thank your spouses, family members, parents, and others who have helped make this moment possible for you with a round of applause. In a way, these candidates are the COVID class. Two years ago, for their vicarage assignment service, it was all virtual. So, PJ, I don't know how you watched and got your vicarage assignment, but you did online. Last year, we were under some very severe restrictions as for how many could attend, every other pew, six feet apart, masks on our faces. But thankfully this year, we are back. We are back to an unrestricted chapel attendance, handshaking, and I get to see your faces once again. And that's wonderful. To make this service possible, I want to thank, as I did at the vicarage service this afternoon, the staff and offices that made it possible, particularly Alex and O'Brien in student campus events, Melanie Ave, Sarah Mena, and the team at Communications, for John Klinger and IT, who have made these things work, whether online or for the sound, or for whatever. I want to thank uh, Jim Marriott and the incredible musicians that have been here this evening. Just an amazing, magnificent musical gift for us tonight. And I also want to thank my administrative assistant, uh, Kathy Whitcomb. As you who are candidates know, she does detailed and careful work in the placement office, but all she keeps organized for me and for you is really quite incredible. Well, at their meeting last Saturday, April 23rd, the Council of Presidents, acting as the Board of Assignments for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, after much prayer and discussion leading up to that vote, approved the placement of these candidates for calls as well as calls at our sister seminary, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. Our sister seminary will have their placement service tomorrow evening. Tonight, we announce calls for 41 students from our Master of Divinity program, four residential alternate route students, two students from our Cross-Cultural Ministry Center in Irvine, California, and we will announce the placement of three deaconess students from our residential program. At this time, it's my privilege to welcome Reverend David Meyer, president of the Michigan District, who serves as the chairman of the Council of Presidents, to share a word of greeting from the COP. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen, President Edgar. Brothers soon to be brothers in the ministry with uh, the men that you're seated, seated, see seated over here. You know, you really are, and I really appreciated, uh, Dr. Hagen, your word tonight. Thank you so much. You really are an answer to prayer. I'd like to explain. You know, your parents have been praying for you for a long time. <laughs> long time. 
And then I think we've heard tonight that the congregations have been praying for a shepherd, also a pastor, also a leader, and you're gonna be answering that prayer. The professors have been praying for you, that you would do well, that you would remember, that you would continue to study, that you would continue to know the Lord as your God. Then of course, there's your parents-in-law. They've been praying. And they want to see you do a great job. They want to see you continue to raise the family up if you indeed have one, that that would be done for the glory of the Lord. But I want you to know especially, before I let you know that they've been praying for you, that the Lord Jesus Christ has been praying for you. In fact, on the night in which he was betrayed, he prayed for you. John 17, of course, we know is the high priestly prayer, correct? It's really interesting to look at that prayer because you begin to see it as a visionary prayer of a movement of God's deeds and desires being done and seeing a lost world come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Notice the movement. First, it's a concentration of Jesus looking at the cross, knowing he's going to die for the glory of the Father. That's why he's doing it. For the joy that was set before him, he, he went to the cross. I believe that was obedience to the Father and love for mankind. He went to the cross. And then it continues as he prays, not only in that visionary prayer of missionary movement for the glory of the Father, but he prays for his disciples. And do you know what he prays? He says, Father, do not take them out of the world. The world needs them. The world needs you. You're going to be salt and light. Good news. You're going to be carrying some admonishment as well. But you're always, I pray, going to speak the truth in love. And he prays then for all that will believe through their word, the ever-expanding circle. And he prays that we, together, as we have come to faith and as we now take out the word, would have joy, that we would have a unity, and that we would have just a, just a, a strength to hold on to the truth of the word and to never compromise it. Christ prayed for you. And I want you to know that these brothers have also. These are men that will be your best friends. They will also be counselors, and they want to be helpers to the nth degree. We want you to succeed. We want to join Christ in the prayer that you remain in the world, that you remain proclaiming the word because the world needs light and it needs you. And so we are thankful for you. We look forward to working together with you, knowing that we can learn much from you as we pray that through some experience and through our battle years, you can learn from us. So brothers, welcome. And well, there's one final prayer that we have. Please complete your work and pass. <laughs> God bless you. We look forward to working together. We're also honored tonight to have with us the Reverend Dr. Matthew Harrison, President of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. President Harrison, I invite you to bring your greetings as well. Congratulations. We love you. We're proud of you. And you're entering the greatest ministerium, the greatest Lutheran ministerium on earth. Sounds audacious, but even for all of our weaknesses and flaws, and we've got them all, it's an amazing blessing. The extent of this Missouri Synod is really quite something, and I experience it. I've come to realize the rule that at any given airport in the world, at any given time, there are at least two LCMS people. <laughs> and I meet at least half of them. It's a great ministerium, a brotherhood, and it's 175 years old today. What a memorable moment. You receive your calls into the ministry the very day the Synod was born in Chicago, Illinois, all those years ago. Who would have thought, who could have dreamed of the blessings that are ours? They are amazing. You will go through many trials as pastors. 
you'll face your first crises right when you get to the parish. And I hope, like me, you're on the phone to your circuit counselor, circuit visitor, first off and, and weekly. Gary R. pulled my fat out of the fire on more than one occasion 30 years ago. And you have the greatest job on earth. You deal with people at their very worst moments. Your ears are going to hear things that you never thought or dreamed you'd hear. And like Leah says, when they go into your ears, they're going to go in as though your ears were a tomb and they will die there. And you will speak forgiveness. And then you'll go to those people's weddings and their baptisms. And you'll be there as they are baptized and come to believe in Jesus. Same people. It's the most profound joy there is, I believe, in the universe, so far as humans are concerned. And you will suffer crosses. You will serve people who are hurting, and you will become like them. Luther said, incarnate in our flesh, and we, like Jesus, become incarnate in the flesh of our neighbor to love and serve them. And in serving and serving under the cross, you will become exactly the pastor, and I would say the deaconess, the pastor that you are meant to be. And he will cause it to happen. My favorite text of the entire Book of Concord is in the section on election, Solid Declaration 1148 and following. God determines in advance those specific afflictions by which he causes us to be conformed to the image of his Son. Therefore, as the Apostle says, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We're so happy for you. Stay in touch, will you? Give us a call. Call me and complain about your district president or something. <laughs> We love you and we'll be very anxious as you spend these next couple of months getting ready and getting ordained. God bless you all. <laughs> uh, pre oh, President Harrison, uh, maybe just over here, okay. I will invite uh, President Meyer and President Harrison to the chancel area, along with President Thomas Ager, uh, President of Concordia Seminary, uh, Dr. Lee Hagan, our preacher for this evening. Thank you for handing Jesus to us this evening, Lee. Dr. Timothy Seleska, the Dean of Ministerial Formation. Dr. David Lewis, Director of the MDiv and Residential Alternate Out Pro Program and also Dr. David Peter, Dean of the Faculty, who will assist me in the uh, distribution of the calls. Dear brothers and sisters, as you hear your name called and your placement announced, remember God's word in Paul's second letter to Corinthians. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. The following candidates have been certified for the office of the Holy Ministry and the Diaconate Ministry by the faculty of Concordia Seminary, and I invite the first group of candidates to come forward. Paul P.J. Arswald, pastor, St. John's Lutheran Church, Denver, Colorado, Rocky Mountain District. Congratulations. 
Andrew Asp, cam campus pastor, Concordia Academy, Roseville, Minnesota, Minnesota South District. Timothy Barber, pastor, Epiphany Lutheran Church, Tallahassee, Florida, Florida, Georgia District. Andrew Berg, associate pastor, our Shepherd Lutheran Church, Avon, Indiana, Indiana District. Brent Berg, pastor, Trinity Lutheran Church, Auburn, Nebraska, Nebraska District. Joey Bluji, associate pastor, Faith Lutheran Church, Branson, Missouri, Missouri District. <laughs> Leslie Chen, Associate Pastor, Grace Lutheran Church, Nashua, New Hampshire, New England District. James Cleland, Associate Pastor, St. Mark Lutheran Church, Houston, Texas, Texas District. Thank you, James. Peter. Peter DeBernie. <laughs> Pastor, Grace Lutheran Church, Mastic Beach, New York, Atlantic District. Michael Duffy, pastor, St. Paul Lutheran Church, Melrose Park, Illinois, Northern Illinois District. Christian Einertsen, pastor, Trinity Lutheran Church, Farmington, Minnesota, Minnesota South District. Will Frenchrum, Associate Pastor, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Seymour, Indiana, Indiana District. Will. Alexander Goodwin, Associate Pastor, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Fairmont, Minnesota, Minnesota South District. Ezra Grabau, Pastor, Faith Lutheran Church, Sioux City, Iowa, Iowa District West. Thomas Gufteson, Associate Pastor, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Michigan District. Eric Hart, Assistant Pastor, the Lutheran Church of St. Luke, Itasca, Illinois, Northern Illinois District. Benjamin Hader, pastor, Zion Lutheran Church, Shabance, Illinois, Northern Illinois District. Ian Heinz, pastor, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, Havana, Illinois, Central Illinois District. Kurt Helwig, pastor, Valley Lutheran High School, Phoenix, Arizona, Pacific Southwest District. Congratulations. Travis Henry, associate pastor, Zion Lutheran Church, Painesville, Ohio, Ohio District. Thank you. Colby Hall, Associate Pastor, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Brookfield, Wisconsin, South Wisconsin District. Brett Jones, Pastor, Trinity Lutheran Church, Hoffman, Illinois, Southern Illinois District. James Lanning, 
pastor, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Centralia, Missouri, Missouri District. Brandon Metcalf, Associate Pastor, Zion Lutheran Church, Bethalto, Illinois, Southern Illinois District. Alaric Morris, Pastor, Peace Lutheran Church, Seymour, Indiana, Indiana District. Kevin Peterson, Pastor, St. Paul Lutheran Church, Addison, Illinois, Northern Illinois District. Congratulations. Benjamin Prohl, Associate Pastor, Trinity Lutheran Church, Tyler, Texas, Texas District. Benjamin Rantham, Pastor, our Savior Lutheran Church, Escanaba, Michigan, North Wisconsin District. Joseph Reinecke, Associate Pastor, Concordia Lutheran Church, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Indiana District. Charles Chuck Ridley, Associate Pastor, Fishers of Men Lutheran Church, Sugarland, Texas, Texas District. Timothy Schulte, Missionary, Lutheran Bible Translators, Concordia, Missouri, Missouri District. <laughs> Jordan Scott, Associate Pastor, Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Rochester, Minnesota, Minnesota South District. Samuel Schick, Associate Pastor, St. Luke's Lutheran Church, Oviedo, Florida, SELC District. Samuel St. John, Associate Pastor, Ascension Lutheran Church, Tucson, Arizona, English District. Michael Stainbrook, Associate Pastor, St. Luke Lutheran Church, Haslett, Michigan, Michigan District. Donald Stein, Pastor, St. Andrew Lutheran Church, Rockton, Illinois, Northern Illinois District. Drew Thompson, Pastor, Christ Our Savior Lutheran Church, Laga Vista, Texas, Texas District. Andrew Thompson, Associate Pastor, St. John Lutheran Church, Plymouth, Wisconsin, South Wisconsin District. Lawton Thompson, Assistant Pastor, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, De Pere, Missouri, Missouri District. Caleb Worrell, Pastor, Shepherd of the Lake Lutheran Church, Garrison, Minnesota, Minnesota North District. Thank you. We have one Master of Divinity student who is in absentia. He is currently serving a deferred vicarage, and his congregation will be calling him. That is Eric Larson, Associate Pastor, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Gretna, Nebraska, Nebraska District. We have four residential alternate route students receiving their calls. One of them is here this evening. Aaron Beckman, pastor, St. Mark Lutheran Church, New Germany, Minnesota, Minnesota South District. The three residential alternate route students who are unable to be here and in absentia, Corey Christians, pastor, 
Salem Lutheran Church, Navasota, Texas, Texas District, Joshua Hahn, Associate Pastor, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Giddings, Texas, Texas District, and Thomas Mueller, Pastor, Zion and Emmanuel Lutheran Churches, Wabay and Sisseton, South Dakota, South Dakota District. We have two students from our Cross Cultural Ministry Center in Irvine, California, who are also receiving calls in absentia. Corey Garrity, Associate Pastor, Redeemer Lutheran Church, Redwood City, California, California, Nevada, Hawaii District, and Joel Rockman, Pastor, St. Paul Lutheran Church, Tracy, California, California, Nevada, Hawaii District. At this time, I ask Dr. Jill Bond to please come forward and join us at the chancel area. Dr. Bond is the Director of Deaconess Studies here at Concordia Seminary, and she will greet and celebrate with our three deaconess candidates. Janie Fisher, Deaconess, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Wentzville, Missouri, Missouri District. Jenny Zoe Hillsman, Deaconess, Concordia Lutheran Ministries, Cabot, Pennsylvania, Eastern District. And Alexandria Alex Schick, Deaconess, Director of Program Ministries, Redeeming Life Outreach Ministries, Sanford, Florida, Florida, Georgia District. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I encourage you with these words from Paul and Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. President Ager, these are Concordia Seminary's pastoral and diaconal candidates for spring 2022. Please stand to sing the canticle.
Our Father, who art in The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Heavenly Father, the author of all wisdom, understanding, and true strength, we ask you to look mercifully upon your servants and send your Holy Spirit into their hearts, that when they must join to fight in the field for the glory of your holy name, and they, being strengthened with the defense of your right hand, may stand in the confession of your faith and of your truth and continue in the same unto the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Please stand. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.